This podcast is sponsored by Rask Invest, Owen's complete guide to money and investing. Visit the Rask Finance website to learn more and join today. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the Australian Investors Podcast, a series exploring the investment philosophies and journeys of some of Australia's leading investors and financial thinkers. I'm Owen Raskovich, founder of The Rask Group. For show notes and other episodes in this series, as well as free educational resources, please visit www.raskfinance.com. Before we go on, it's important to remember the Australian Investors Podcast is provided for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon to make an investment, financial or taxation decision. The information included in this podcast does not take into account your needs, goals or objectives and guests appearing on the show may have a financial interest in some of the products mentioned. Please read all the important disclosure documents and refer to the RAS Group's Financial Services Guide on the RAS Finance website. Melissa Brown is a three-time author, a financial advisor at The Money Bar and serial entrepreneur. She's also a shoe-loving accountant. Mel is a regular feature on TV and a writer for Fairfax. She's also been featured in Vogue, Cosmo, and named by the AFR and Westpac in the 100 Women of Influence. In this episode, we talk about Mel's early days, the journey from law to accounting, building businesses, financial advice, and more. Mel is a speed reader, having read thousands of books before writing her own. So I ask her for her must-read finance books. I trust you'll enjoy this conversation with Melissa Brown of The Money Bar. Melissa, I just want to say thanks for joining me on the podcast. Sure, no problem. Thanks for having me. I didn't know where to start this because there's so much. I'd, I could just sit here forever and talk to you, but I figured it would be... I'm not s- that interesting. <laughs> well, I beg to differ. I, I think the most sensible place for us to start is to say that there may be some swearing, potentially, if I slip up. <laughs> Um, the name of one of your books may yeah. catch me out. Sure. So we'll see you know, how we go. We're, we're a pretty open bunch here. Um, so if it happens, it happens. Cool. But anyway, let's move on with it. Um, this podcast series is typically focused on investors or mm-hmm. financial authors or people in the industry and their journey. Yep. And also what they've learned and then how that's, I suppose, impacted them later in life and the career mm-hmm. and businesses that they've started. Yeah. You are the first, as far as I can recall, first financial advisor. So you'll bring some unique perspectives, Yay. which is, yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, and I believe, I, I hope someone doesn't call me off to this, but I mm. think you're the first Australian author we've had. So, oh, cool. And yeah. accountant, I'm a slash. Oh, there you go. Yeah, accountant. <laughs> Wonderful. There we go. So you're pretty much, yeah. Yeah, 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 everything that we need to really have an enjoyable conversation. Nice. Um, let's start where we always start. And ask you about where your passion for finance, money, investing, every all the yep. new details. Where did it come from? Oh gosh, um, I'm not sure where it came from. It's, I guess, I, I stumbled into tax um, because I studied accounting um, because I was studying law, and I, I just halfway through I realised that wasn't for me. Oh. So accounting was a thing that I just started doing um I think because my I felt so bad for my dad because he so desperately wanted a lawyer in the family (laughs) (laughs) that I figured well he was an accountant um he's suggesting this is something else I could do I'll just try that um whereas finance and money is the thing that I chose and it's the thing Mm. that I'm really passionate about because when I was helping entrepreneurs and business owners in accounting, the one thing that they always had a problem with is either the money side of the business or the numbers or typically their personal Mm. wealth creation. Um, Not all uh, business owners, but some. So I started to get interested in the financial part of it then because I wanted to give them that more robust help. Mm. Um, But certainly personally for me, um, when I started to play with shares and play with property and realise that that can really give me some financial independence myself, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think that's got, I mean, personally, that's exciting, mm. the concept of money being able to give you financial independence. And then that evolved to writing about it um, and wanting to help particularly other women yep. realise that as well. Okay. Looking at your CV now, mm. Impressive. You seem to be this serial entrepreneur, if you like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did that – Did was anyone personally in your life influencing you to take risk and to yeah. challenge the norm? 
Yeah, not really. No. Um, and if I look back, yes, my dad owned his own business okay. and he tells the story of he used to work for a bank, had three kids, and he told his dad that he was going to leave the bank and start his business. And his dad was horrified. Mm. Said, oh, you're going to end, you know, you should stay with the bank. It's a safe job. Um, and my dad loves to tell that story because at age 53, he retired. Mm. And now he spends half his life cruising. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, my thinking back, my grandma, um, my grandma ran a coffee shop mm -hmm. during the Second World War. Um, okay. And that's how my grandparents were able to buy a house. So hmm. that entrepreneurship, I think, is in my genes somewhere. Hmm. Um, and certainly my now husband um, has encouraged me to explore that more. So there's someone in my corner saying, yeah, you totally can do that. Yeah, take um, the risk. Yeah. yeah, and I'm stupid enough to believe him and the voice in my head <laughs> that says I can as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know the feeling. Um, so you, you touched on accounting. Did you – so you went – from high school to straight to uni, is that right? Yeah, high school straight to uni, studied law um, and then about two and a half years in, so I had a scholarship with the bank. Okay. Um, so CBA for a red hot minute because they shut theirs down and then Westpac, I think it was. Um, I've been a bit of a bank tart with CBA, Westpac <laughs> and NAB as they all shut down their scholarship schemes um, and then moved from that to accounting. Okay. Yeah. And did you uh, did you work for yourself straight out? Or did you no, start somewhere No, so else? it was the bank who paid for my study. Yep. Um, and then it was, I went from the bank to my dad's firm um, and really started at the bottom. And then when he sold his firm, I moved to another smaller firm. Because what I realised at that point was I didn't want to work for a big firm mm. and be a cog that really didn't see very much. Mm. I loved the feeling of starting and ending with the one client mm. um, and really seeing a difference in that small and medium business owner. So mm. I realised that earlier on. And then I went from that business to subcontracting with a few clients to starting my own business. Okay, so you sort of had this side hustle would you say or absolutely yeah. yeah it was very much a side hustle and it wasn't meant to be a side hustle that I did for the rest of my life um I was studying at the time and I figured that that side hustle could just pay for that study while I figured out what I wanted to do with my life <laughs> okay well I think that's a great way to do it um and it's certainly paid dividends now mm. I'm often envious of accountants oh really in, in some ways <laughs> wait for it <laughs> um because as a, I suppose now as a business person myself, but also as an investor, we're trying to look at financial statements and understand mm. businesses. But we don't, if you're in, an investor in, say, public share, like shares in the stock exchange, you don't get to see what goes on and the effort and the, the yeah. grind that these small businesses, um, you know, that goes into them and also mm. the risks that the people take. Oh, absolutely. And I, yeah. I, I can imagine that you would have seen that firsthand. You would have seen mm. some of these small businesses struggling. So did you... Did, you said end to end. Yep. Was it as much about the people as much as about learning the business as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I I discovered Jim Collins probably about age 28. So mm -hmm. his book, Good to Great. Mm. Um, and I fell in love with business and strategy and um, went and studied my master's. And I that's what I realised that I was passionate about. So yes, we can do tax and we're great at tax but we're actually great at helping you build your business. Yep. And so that's the thing that I'm most excited about when mm. we work with business owners. Mm. It's how can we help you grow your business or how can we help you move your business? Sure, you might have a $12 million business, but if your profit's at 1%, who can get excited about that? Mm. What if it, we could move that needle to 15%? Mm. And then the person that's sitting in across from you at the table, you're having that direct impact on mm. uh, which can be life-changing for sure. some people so yeah I, I get excited about the numbers excited about the strategy but seeing the result ultimately that's mm. the fun part yeah great um so you you've, you've segued from working for someone else and into your own job and your own business sorry yep you as far as I'm aware it was about 2001 you started AT and or at a and TA? Yeah, correct? so it was called Accounting and Taxation uh, Advantage. Right. So it was um, – phone books were still around. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and the internet had just started to be a thing. 
And I figured we want to – I couldn't afford much advertising. Mm. So pick a name that started with A <laughs> and for the internet have accounting and taxation in it so that you appeared high on this <laughs> search engine. Yeah. That was the only thought I put into my business name. <laughs> um, so now we call it ATA because yeah. it's just – ridiculously long <laughs> no that's great it's perfect it says it on the tin right yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah great okay so how old were you when you started this i would have been 28, 28. And when w- i first started yeah. yeah and were you by yourself initially yeah yeah, yeah. so started off with myself and a few clients and mm. literally letterbox uh dropped around the neighborhood mm. Um, and went from there. Yeah, and did, did that work? Yeah, it did back then. Absolutely. Yeah. And we call them the originals. Some of those clients are still with me mm. today, which that's the relationship part, yep. which is really lovely. Yeah, great. Um, and I, I, circling back to accounting as a profession today, mm. and people choosing to study accounting, would you say that it's a it's a good career to move into now? Well, certainly it's a broad career. So you can choose tax, you can choose corporate, you could work in the startup community, um, you could work as a CFO. I think there are so many different parts Mm. to being an accountant. Um, And yes, I think um, the days of being being an average tax accountant is numbered with the rise of zero and the ability. In zero at the moment, um, you can go... You can press a button and your BAS will be lodged with the tax office. And there's going to be more and more of that. But... For strategy and for the what I call the sexy side of accounting, mm. I think that's there's um, a lot more that we can explore with that. Yeah, right. So it's more like you said that delivering that experience for the yeah. client and understanding their business. Yeah, definitely. Rather than say the numbers game like it was in the past. Well, I think it's it's very much a it's in, for me it's and um, Karen James uh, who used to work in Women in Focus at CBA um, and now runs on Purpose Hub. I think said it beautifully. Business owners run with a gut um, and they make decisions based on gut. Accountants can bring that database gut. Mm. So now you're not just relying on, oh, I think this is right. Mm. I feel like this is right. Now it's a numbers-based decision and that can actually help you feel good or feel that not so great about that decision. Mm. Would you say that most small businesses that you see, would you say most of the, the business owners um, probably, you know, that they need that helping hand when it comes oh, to an accountant. Absolutely. Um, there would absolutely be a small percentage that have got it and are rock stars and a total geeking with their spreadsheets and the numbers and absolutely love it. Mm. Um, but the lion's share, uh, they didn't start a business to play with numbers and mm. accounting and tax. Um, so they see that as a hassle. And what we try to do is make them realise that They don't need to know all the numbers in their business, just the ones that can help them make great business decisions. Mm. Um, And just to see their numbers differently, not to be scared of it, not to think of it as a, oh, they're like my vegetables and (laughs) I just have to eat them. (laughs) You know, vegetables can be good. (laughs) It just depends how you display them. If you're going to boil them until they're mashed and (laughs) colourless, of course they're going to be horrible. Um, And numbers, I think, are exactly the same. Yeah, right, okay. And how would you say, So, would you say to us, a small business owner or a would-be small business owner that mm. one of the first things you should do is go out and seek in the advice of an accountant or when's yeah. the best time to approach an accountant? I think early on. So often yeah. if we get a, a business a few years down the track and they're really starting to do well, um, either a couple of th- – th- three things usually happen. One, wow, you've really winged this and it's paid off. Um, two, you've winged this and – gee, you've left a lot of money on the table because you haven't priced properly or you're really heavy on your expenses or you don't have a clue and maybe you should go get a job. Mm. Um, So I think the earlier you can get um, help from a good accountant, like not an accountant, a a good accountant. Not any accountant, yep. um, And and to go and date them to, to find out, well, what do you think I should be doing? And do you do more than just tax? And tell me about your reporting. And do you have packages? And do you quote up front? Yeah. Um, and accountants need to be good business owners now. And if you get the sense that they're not running a good business, just run a mile. <laughs> <laughs> and would you say, in your experience, that it's, it's perhaps better to see a smaller accountant or go to one of the, the larger firms that won't name names? Honestly, it depends on what you want and what your business is. So small firms can be incredible and certainly um, you get that personal relationship. They can be incredibly boutique. Some of their knowledge is incredibly specialised and deep. Mm. Um, But there are absolutely situations that a small firm can't necessarily handle and they either need to um, 
talk to a large firm and partner with them or pass the client onto a larger right. firm. So a, a global or a, pub, a, a company that's going to take a business that's going to take their company public, for example, I'd be... Yep, handball. Hand, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Because <laughs> you want to do the right thing for your client. Yep. I can see already that how passionate you are about, about this and from what I can tell from the outside, the business was a success mm-hmm. and is a success today. So from 2001 right up to, I'm going to skip right up to 2012 mm. and this is when you published your first book, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. Uh, More Money. More Money for Shoes. Yes. Okay. Can yep. you tell us about that? Sure. So, I, so I'd so i started to plan my business and I got a divorce uh, age 33 mm-hmm. and I did what a lot of people do and kind of figure out, is this what I want to do with my life? Do I even mm. want to have a business anymore? I press pause on taking any new clients in. Um, and after that year, I realised, well, I do want to still be running an accounting business. It just needs to look very different from the one I currently am. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we changed everything. Uh, we quote up front, we put in a monthly system where if you come to us, we um, pop you into a, what we call a tax month so that we have capacity for business consulting. Mm-hmm. Um, but we wanted to, I wanted to show the world that we were different, not just say we were different. Mm-hmm. And I've always loved writing. Um, I got into law okay. on the back of my writing. Right. Um, so I started to write a blog just to fuel that creativity in me where I tried to find out if there was a parallel between fashion and, and figures. Mm. Um, so numbers, not not bodies. Um, <laughs> and I quickly realised that there was. So what I did from that is I took it to a couple of publishers and potentially I could have got it published but it was going to be black and white and no pictures but I wanted a full colour book that a woman would uh, read and then think, oh, that doesn't seem that hard. Mm. Um, and it's pretty enough that she'll keep reading. Um, and so I self-published it and that's that was more money for shoes. So when you say mm. self-published, I'm new to this, I've never published a book. Mm. How does, so you take it to the publisher? Yeah, so you can take it to a publishing house that does self-publishing. Mm. Um, so in mine, it was Lisa Messenger who runs the Collective Hub, okay. which is a magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, and she made it beautiful and and mm. was able to put it out there with an ISBN and um, get it to a distributor so it actually went into bookstores and mm. yeah so you have a whole b- bunch of different options now with publishing mm. and self-publishing is one of them okay mm. and was it a success absolutely I c- well it was really successful for me because I said that I if I saw it as an expensive business card so I didn't okay. ever expect to sell a whole bunch of copies even even though I did um, but I saw it as an expensive business card that I wanted to give away as many as I could and get it into the hands of as many people as I could mm. so that they read it and went, ha, huh, this woman's doing something a bit different. Maybe I should go talk to, the, to mm. her. Um, and certainly if I um, – so, yes, it brought success in terms of clients but also PR opportunities. Mm. So, you know, here I was, a little accountant out in the western suburbs and you know, I didn't go to the – fancy school or anything like that so to try and um get people to care about what an accountant says was kind of hard um but we sent these books in white glossy shoe boxes to a whole bunch of editors um all around the shop and I ended up getting a call from Fairfax and said you know what uh the editor at the time said I'm surrounded by gray men in suits or men in gray suits um and I really need a chick would you Mm. come and write for us I thought for a red hot minute and yep. so it opened doors like that. It, um, I, so I wrote for Cosmo, I've written for Latte, um, mm. for Vogue, for Bazaar, like there's been so much since and it started with that book. It snowballed from that point on. Absolutely. Well, we could probably even go back further and say with the blog. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because yeah, so that was the playing part of it. Would you mm. encourage people to do that, to be creative and, and to to just put it out there, like write a oh, blog? Or? I think whatever – I think every business person is creative anyway because mm. they're doing something interesting, most of uh, most of us. And even if it's not interesting, the risk that you take, the creativity that you have to show. Um, I don't think every business owner should write a blog, but maybe they should vlog. Mm-hmm. So for me, um, I don't love video. I, I love watching it. I don't love seeing myself <laughs> on it, so I'm loath to. I'm much more comfortable in front of my laptop writing, so that's going to be my default. Other people, 
uh, vlogging and just getting their ideas down. Um, you know, I think we're too precious with creativity now. I think we just need to get our ideas out and throw them out into the world and see what works. Mm. Um, and certainly for me, that's what I did. I think, personally, I think it's a great thing in the finance industry because it is mm. so hard to be creative and differentiate yourself. If you're, if you're yeah. up against a thousand others in, say, uh, a, for a job application, why not write a blog and it mm. doesn't cost you anything relatively so give it a shot. Absolutely. And you've got that voice, don't you, where That's people it. can say, oh, okay, where well, I understand your point of view and where you're coming from. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'll put it this way. I've never met someone who wrote a blog that regretted it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, so let's jump forward from 2012, a year later, mm-hmm. and I think again in 2014, you're named a finalist in New South Wales Telstra yep. Business Awards, is that right? Yeah, I think it was 14 and 15, or 13 and 14, it was two years in a row. Yeah, okay, yeah. and how did that come about? Oh, I just decided perhaps I should start entering awards, that might be, because we'd really had some quite explosive business growth and we were doing some interesting things and I wondered, right. maybe I should enter some awards. Mm. <laughs> so we entered our local business awards um, and we won those mm. and I looked to the Telstra Business Awards and I just wanted to put myself in an arena where it was against bigger businesses and businesses that weren't in my little pond mm. um, and it was an incredible experience. Okay, that's great. Mm. It, it looks, it's wonderful. It looks good on the CV and yeah. well deserved. Yeah. Um, so, you also finished your masters around this time. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you went back and studied. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I'm such a study geek. Yep. So yeah, I've just been to LA to UCLA, um, and it's, if it's taught me anything, it's that I need to study more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love it. Great. So you're over there for yeah to go to uni and do a short yeah, course or something. Work or? and study. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. You, you were very busy around this time, and I, yeah. to be honest, as <laughs> Now, I, I, it just ramped up. <laughs> I've got to say, as a small business owner myself, I don't know how, I, looking at what you've done, I'm thinking, geez, I don't know if I could handle that. Um, because I worked a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Not too long after that, or around about the same time, you co founded, uh, as far as I can tell, it's, a, it's kind of like an early learning center yeah. um, called Thinkers. Thinkers Inc. 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 Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about that? Because it's it's kind it's of different random. to all the other stuff you've, you've done. Absolutely. And if, it's even more random because um, my husband and I are purposefully child-free, so we've chosen not to have mm. kids. And I think my mother doesn't love that decision and I think she thinks it's cruel that I own a preschool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the co-founder of the school is Rod Soper um, and he is an incredible educator. Okay. Uh, so he used to be head of a school out at the Northern Beaches, kindergarten teacher for a decade, and then he was consulting to the space. And he kept coming to me and telling me all the problems he was seeing about it being babysitting. And yet three to five is that critical time in brain development where we can have the biggest impact. Mm-hmm. And I know for me, I was seeing my entrepreneurs and business owners, and I would say at least half weren't great at school Mm. and not just not great not average but not great they Mm. were kind of this square peg round holes and I Rod and I kind of got to talking and his thing was he wants to change a school system um, and create a model that really impacts little ones and teaches them to creatively and critically think whereas I want to create the next generation of philosophers and entrepreneurs Mm. and CEOs and business leaders who can think I mean I think our industrial method of schooling is pushing out drones and people that mm. just accept rubbish um, and swallow it without questioning it. Whereas to create the ability to think in a little one, I think that's critical. So can that's you, my legacy. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> can you give us an example of a student perhaps or a younger person that mm. this would suit? So we have – so it's, it's two to five years old. Yep. Um, so we've had all sorts. Uh, so – We've had kids that just haven't been great socialised to kids that have been really well socialised and this just elevates that. It kind of leverages what's already there Mm. to kids where, you know, they've been an only child and maybe they've really had those baby tendencies and by the time they graduate, we say say to them, you know, we want you to come back and read to the kids Mm. as as a a way to stay connected Mm. Um, and just the growth in them in that three years is astounding. But, yeah, any any child two to five, um, yeah, there's kind of no... Yep. 
That's great. Loose with that. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll be watching it and see how it plays out. It's, I think it's a great initiative. Yeah, well, we want um, we want up to five because we want to be uh, we want to call them lighthouses and for them for people to look at them. And we know people are doing uh, preschool really well. We're certainly not suggesting that, but we want to have these lighthouses where people can say, "Wow, what's going on there?" Because those kids are really different that are coming out of there. Mm. So maybe we should change how we're doing it. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, it was around this time that. You've started this business that you wrote your second book. <laughs> yeah, fabulous but broke. It's about yep. financial fairy tales, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and obviously being in the preschool and starting that, I was in that fairy tale mindset. So I think <laughs> okay. that's where that's birthed from. Yeah. But yeah, they're 13 financial fairy tales um, that tells a story and then tells what the typical ending would be if you carried on behaving that particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it gives you the alternative ending if you change your behaviour. And the idea is that it's full colour um, and that it's designed as a coffee table book, that you pick it up, oh, read a yeah, story nice. and then have those conversations. Mm. Mm. Yeah, great. And, and how did this, I suppose, how did this sell and appeal to the audience relative to the first book? Um, definitely not as well, um, but people still love it. But I call it my ego project. Okay. Um, and if you look back now, you know, every business owner looks back and goes, I think, and says, okay, well, I understood that, I understood that, and Mm. that decision was ego. So (laughs) I really wanted to write that book. Um, It definitely hasn't done as well as the first or the third, but I still love it. So it's total ego project. That's interesting. That's an interesting way to frame it. I think we all have them. I can can certainly – that makes sense to me. I've had a few of them over the – over my short period. Yeah, you just um, want to make them as less expensive as possible. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. Um, so the next business, uh, mm. which is kind of like an adjunct to the accounting business in, mm. in my mind, is this money bar. Yeah. And you, you started this with uh, Lauren Law. Yeah, yeah. my co-founder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll get into the exact s- the specifics of it, mm. but uh, can you, I suppose, just give us a high-level picture of what it is and what you do? Yeah, so we were forced to become financial planners as accountants if we wanted to keep talking yep. about SMSF. Um, and because we did, and when we looked at the space, Lauren and I had always struggled um, having great relationships with financial planners mm. and particularly for our younger clients because they just don't think they're worth it. Mm. Um, and mm. so Lauren and I went, bugger it, let's just have a crack ourselves. So... We started it, We, if you're a boomer um, or if you've retired or you're looking to retire, we'll actually send you on to someone else. Right. Um, so there is that at probably age of 55, 60, we'll still mm-hmm. talk to, <laughs> sounds really terrible, um, but we're primarily aimed at Gen X, Gen Y um, and we're really unapologetic about that. And our message is absolutely that you have that a heart moment at, either a pivotal age of 25, 30, 35, and when you realise you need to financially adult yeah. and we want to help you do that. Okay. Um, it's full service. It's We do as much cash flow budgeting and projections and holding you accountable um, as we do investment. Um, and I would probably call us wealth coaches mm. as much as we're financial planners. Mm, okay. And um, for any of our other advisors that are listening and potentially some of our listeners, how do you funnel people into your business? Is it mm. ma- mainly handballing them across or wearing two hats with the accounting? Or Yeah, it's a bit books? of that. Yeah, so definitely the accounting firm, which is quite a large firm now, feeds clients. Mm-hmm. Um, the books, absolutely. So, and particularly the last one, um, un, what did we say? Unfudge Un-fudge your finance. Your finance. <laughs> <laughs> um, has absolutely been a feeder into yep. that. Banking Commission, I'm not going to lie, has yep. been like free advertising for mm. us with people contacting us saying, we know, we understand your, you refund commissions, your full fee for service and you're female. Mm. Um, I think that's, it's been a lot of men in the mm. Banking Commission and I'm not saying at any, please don't hear me say that um, all men are yeah. problematic, but for us, the fact that it was primarily males in front of the Banking Commission meant that we were sought out. Mm. And I'd be curious to find out if that's the case for other female financial advisors, mm. if they had the same um, sw- uh, influx of uh, clients because of it. But also media. Um, so I do a bit of media. Um, and certainly every time I do that, there's an influx. I speak. Um, and again, when I do that, that's part of our strategy. Mm. Um, I'll receive clients as a result. So. Yeah. Mm. Great. I think, yeah, I I can see why you're probably being inundated with all the books and mm. all the how busy you keep yourself. 
you touched on something there about refunding commissions. Mm. Perhaps you can, for our listeners that haven't been to see a financial advisor, mm. can you explain what you mean? So, um, and I know commissions are less and less of an issue now. So once upon a time, you'd receive commission on loads of different products. But certainly for insurance commissions, um, if we receive a commission on insurance, we'd either dial it down so that we weren't receiving any or if or if we've received it because it's been transferred to us, um, we'll physically refund that commission that we receive back to the client. Um, and certainly I think people aren't aware of some of those commissions. And again, they're being wound down. But for an insurance commission, that could be 100% of the first year's policy. Mm, that's a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, so we charge a fixed fee and then we refund the rest back. Mm. Yeah, I just think, uh, certainly in the accounting world, I mm. haven't operated on an hourly rate um, or an hourly basis for years. And I think it's an it's unethical because it, it means that you kind of want to go slow mm. so that you're going to get paid more. So mm. I already see that that behaviour is unethical. So I kind of look across to the financial planning world and say, well, I don't ever want someone to think I'm putting you into that product because of that commission. So therefore, mm. we're just simply not going to take it. Yeah, great. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. It's, it's, I operate my business in the same philosophy. Mm. Let's talk, touch on your ne- next book. Um, <laughs> I don't want to slip up. Let's call it Unfudge Your Finances. It's a safe way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's a little bit more I'll, X-rated. <laughs> I'll paint the picture. It's a black hard copy book with this bright pink text in the head, mm-hmm. headline. And um, if you walk into any bookstore, I walked into a readings bookstore and you see it. There it is. It's in front of you. Uh, title and everything. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. For our listeners mm. who have, perhaps haven't but probably will after this, what does the book cover that your other two books didn't? Oh, it's completely different. So um, I was more vulnerable and personal in this book than I ever was potentially in the other ones. Mm. Um, and it looks at money mindset because I believe that we could hand out flies with here's steps one to seven that you need to do. If you follow this, you'll get your finances sorted. And if someone did that, then sure, it'd happen. But what we know, or what I know, is the, psych- the psychological um, reasons behind why you're behaving with money is the driver mm. often to why you're going to behave. So um, money mindset takes up a chunk of the book. Um, and then we look at habits um, and then look at look at different parts of investing, including is debt good, bad and okay, shares, should I buy my own home? Um, yeah, so it kind of splits it up into those mm. three things and introduces concepts that perhaps people hadn't th- heard of, such as the 30-day financial detox mm. um, and breaking up with money and, yeah. Yeah, great concepts. It was fun to write. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, we'll get to some of those I suppose need money tricks and mind mm. um, mental hacks you've 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 come up with, but one thing and you touched on it was one thing that struck it struck me was how candid you are and, mm. and transparent because you admit that it wasn't all roses Absolutely. in your journey. I mean, yep. I think at one stage you I, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. You say in your thirties. You lived in a share house with six friends. Six friends. Yeah, frat it was, house. It was almost yep. like restarting and just Absolutely. going for it. I mean. I love I love to see that because it, mm. and that's what this podcast is all about: getting to know who you are and yeah. understanding that not even the experts, you know, we make yeah. mistakes and everything like that. So, was that particularly hard for you to bring out those emotions? Oh, absolutely. So I wrote and deleted that so many different times. Um, I asked my husband what he thought. I asked mm. Lauren what she thought um, because I just felt I felt like I needed it to go in because mm. it showed that I understood what the reader was going through, but it also showed that I cared because I was willing to show my mm. um, underbelly. And if I'm talking in a book saying, which I, I do all through the first couple of chapters, like there is an almighty ick factor around money. We don't talk about it. We don't want to share. Mm. And if I'm not willing to share, then how does that look? Um, so, yeah, when I was 33, I divorced and I didn't want <sighs> – He's not a bad bloke, um, he, but he made it, as we all do when we're going through these things, made a throwaway line around how you're not going to make it on your own. Mm. Um, and I s- thought, well, fine, I'll show you. And to, to prove that I could do it completely on my own, I gave the entire divorce proceeds to charity, wow. to Opportunity International and set up a trust bank um, or a couple of trust banks, which was lovely. 
until I realised I didn't have bond, I didn't have money for wages, I didn't have super. Like I just wow. did not think about it. <laughs> so I, it was a necessity. I had to, I rang my friends that were living in Chatswood and in a share house and said, can I stay in the basement because I just need somewhere to crash. And I'm so grateful I had that opportunity mm. and I could do that. But for a year, they basically held me there while I quite um, embarrassingly tried to rebuild um, from an absolute place of deficit. Mm. So, yeah, it was really tough. And I didn't tell anyone because I, oh, was, well. way, I was mortified that I was in this position. That's a, it's a remarkable story, I think, because you've, you know, if it, let's say you've hit rock bottom and then you've come back mm. it's, and come back in a big way, I might add. That's yeah. incredible. Um, unfudge your finances <laughs> is a catchy head, headline entitled, <laughs> did the publishers say anything? Was there any pushback? No. So I actually self-published at first yeah. okay. um, for Business Chicks Expo. And I, I did a limited run for that expo thinking, I'm never going to be able to put it on social media. I'm not really going to be able mm. to flog this anywhere else. But I think this could be really great for that audience. And I think they'll really respond well to it. And they responded so well that someone from Alan and Unwin contacted me and mm. said, so we've seen this book and we kind of would like it. So they took it in its entirety um, mm. and they didn't change. From memory, there was maybe a couple of tweaks in paragraphs. But that was it. Mm. They just took it, which right. I, I I love them for doing that. Yeah. Mm. Can, if, once again, touching on the book publishing idea, is it hard to sell a lot of books in Australia these days? Yeah. Look, um, if you're Scott Pape, I think yeah. he's up to six hundred thousand or maybe more. So mm. he no. <laughs> yeah, not if you're him. Yeah. Um, absolutely, it's tough. Uh, it's a much smaller market than the states, so the pool's smaller. Mm. Um. But a bestseller for nonfiction is considered 5,000 copies oh. in Australia, I think the number is. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of books to show that you've done well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think unless you have a name or a hook, I think it's hard to yeah. And you've got that books. existing platform where you can... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I've been very fortunate um, with mine and I'm very grateful that it's been accepted so well. Mm. No, it seems to be doing well from the from what I can tell. Yeah, um, and it's in I posted on Instagram today because um, someone posted the Dutch copy, so oh. it's in a language that I, so I can't read my book. <laughs> um, and it's in the UK as well, so oh. it's kind of cool seeing it yeah, launched great. around the world. So, so did you know it was going to be in Dutch? Yeah, so they uh, have to come to you and with right steel yep. to say, "Is this okay?" So, oh. Oh, yeah, that's great. which is kind of fun. Well, and like you said, my, my majority of all or a lot of it is to do with this. These, these mental tricks and, and mm. rewiring yourself. Absolutely. So it makes sense that it's, you know, it can be used anywhere in the world and yeah. can be you know, relevant to people. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah the concepts are global. They're not – I mean, sure, there are some things uh, like renting versus buying that they needed to look at over in the UK and the, the Netherlands to say is it's relevant mm. to us and how is it – how do we need to change it? But for the most part, yeah, there was there was tweaks. Oh, great. That's, mm. that's, I didn't even think about that. That's wonderful. Um we talked about this off air a bit. Mm. You offer some online yep. courses where people can, I suppose, take a bit of a deeper dive mm. uh, on some of the concepts that you touch on in the books. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah. So, so I have something called the 30-Day Detox and I encourage people when they're doing it to do exercises, to actually be really mindful during that time so mm. that they actually don't hate the process but can finish the 30 days going, wow. See, I didn't just save money from not spending because um, that's all that a 30-day detox is. It's 30 days of not buying anything new. Mm. But during those 30 days, I sorted out my super. I set up bowl accounts for my bank accounts. Um, I figured out what my relationship with money is. Um, I started some regular savings. So actually really start to sort yourself out. Um, so because there was that demand, I set up an online course so that every single day – you had something you could do, whether it was a financial challenge to find more money mm -hmm. um, or to start a business or just what. Um, so that's done. So that's kind of done really well. Um, and I'm going to tweak that in the new year because I just want it to be a, just have content that's a little bit different from the book now that it's been out for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, that's been great fun. Yeah. I, one thing that, that, stuck with me was this the financial detox my partner and I considered 
giving it a shot mm. uh, and we, it's still on the cards. Um, so let's... Well, I do that twice a year. You do? Still, absolutely. You know, yep. Press I, reset and do it twice a year. Okay. Mm. Well, yeah. I think it's... This is the thing. I think, you know, I'm finance guy and mm-hmm. I think we live pretty frugally, my partner and I, but I figure, you know, why not give it a go? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, well, people it's just... look at me a bit funny when I say I'm excited <laughs> to do it. But... <laughs> well, it's we're so... We're a, t- a tap and pay... Or tap and go culture. Yep. We just we so, we just default think and we're so unconscious so much of what we do. So mm. it's just resetting. Just a re- chance to reset. Yeah. And for the record, you you still buy your groceries. You still pay your utility Absolutely. bills. Absolutely. So you choose how you're going to behave. So for me, I always detox from shoes, clothes, magazines, books. Oh, books. That's the hardest one. <laughs> Um, but I don't detox from coffee or eating out because for me that's not a problem, but the stuff's a problem. Okay. Um, my husband only really detoxes from coffees and <laughs> eating out because he's, uh, you know, by the time he goes to do his detox, he has two coffees. He buys them two at a time with a croissant under his oh. arm <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he's buying lunch as well that day. So he's, his day with coffees and lunch could be yeah. 50, 60 bucks and he just doesn't realise it. Yeah. So, yeah, wow. it resets yeah. him and then he's good to go again. He's back to his two coffees a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, this, you know, talking about a financial detox, it sounds like it's such, you know, for some people I'm going to say mm. it's such a boring thing. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. That's the kind of pushback I get a lot. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I mean, people, clients probably come to you and are prepared. Mm. But how would you deal with that if someone, like say, pretend... You're talking to me and I'm having a tough time convincing my partner that yeah. we should be doing a financial detox or talking about money. How would you So there that? would be a couple of different conversations I'd have. Um, first of all, I'd find out what your money's, money identity was um, because she might be a saver mm. and you might be a spender. So her detox might actually involve her spending mm. for 30 days, um, which sounds really strange. But I have some clients where they are hoarding to the point Mm. where they're scared to spend. So for them, it's actually about loosing the reins and moving money to a fun account and spending that money. Like, I mean, that's a small amount of people, but it is. But otherwise, I'd say if you're saying no to a financial detox, you absolutely need to do this (laughs) because that gut reaction of, Mm. oh, God, no. As soon as I see that on someone's face, I go, aha, yes, <laughs> you absolutely have to do that. Yeah. Um, and I can't tell you the number of talks that I've given um, where uh, when I suggest the idea of a detox, you see women nudge each other. And as I see it, I go, oi, nudgy, yeah, yeah. you should be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it would be if your first reaction is I can't possibly do this, mm. you actually need to do that more than you know. Mm. It's interesting that you, you touched on it um, for some people, it is an issue. Mm. Saving money, hoarding money, being misers, and, and absolutely not living in the moment enough, and it's, yep. it's a delicate balance, right? Mm. You you say something in the book about your like getting the right money mindset and yep. and the way to think about money and the goals that people set. You know, every year or mm. up to a new year, people will set goals. Yeah, and one way you frame it is, what am I prepared to suffer for? Yeah, why yep. why would why do you say that? Because I think if with goals, we all love this, have this like utopian concept of goals. And once we think of a goal, it'll just magically evolve and <laughs> life will be sweet and unicorns will come and kiss us at night. Uh, but the truth is that it doesn't matter if you want to study something new, run a marathon, lose weight, find a partner, there's a bit of pain involved, whether that's some sleepless nights, some reading textbooks, some getting on dating apps, um, physical pain if you're running. Um, there's suffering involved. Mm. So you want to f- make sure that the goal you've set is exciting enough that you're actually prepared to suffer for it. And if it's not, my question is always, are they your goals? Which is why I, I ask the question first around what life do you want to design? Because I believe too many people are saying, oh, but the not logical next step is to get a house and to have kids and to do the private school and what have you. Whereas the question is, well, is that actually right for you? And if you're acting up against that or if you're sabotaging that, is that because you're not prepared to suffer for that? Mm. And what do you want instead? Hmm. Okay. I think it's a great way to put it. Um, 
saying that this is an investment podcast, I think it would be mm. remiss of me not to talk about it, um, <laughs> investing. So how do you like, – you're um, dealing with many younger people, mm. you know, probably new, not necessarily perhaps new to the workforce, but – you know, they're, they're starting out in careers, they're probably earning some, some good money, they're looking at houses, they're thinking about investing, but mm. do they, don't they? How do you typically advise clients? Yeah. Is there a particular structure or way you go about things? Yeah, so we obviously look at where the client's at when they come to us. So what does their ground zero look mm. like? So if a client has credit card debt, which unfortunately too many of our clients mm. come to us with, um, we often the first thing that we do is we do some cash flow modeling for them. We do that exercise around what life do you want, the relationship you have with money, do you think money's good, bad, or okay? So we do that with all our clients because we really want to understand the psyche that they mm. have with money. Um, then we figure out where they want to go so that they get excited about that because no one's excited about paying down credit card debt. Mm. But if I'm excited about buying a house in three years' time, maybe I could get excited about the credit card debt. Um, And then if there's credit card debt, we work out a plan for them to pay that off as quickly as possible. Um, And then with some of our clients, we actually have accountability where we check in each month to say how Mm. you're going. Because if you're trying to do that on your own and you're trying to motivate yourself, it just doesn't often work. Mm. Whereas if you know someone's going to be ringing and checking on you, you're more likely to do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So that's if you've got debt. If someone's coming in with a with no debt but nothing. So we come up with a bit of a savings plan. And again, we go, we do that whole exercise again. What life do you want to design? Um, and then we come up with some sort of savings plan. So if they're living at home, it's let's save the maximum amount we can. You know, you might think, you might have heard 10% is good, but hey, let's save 50% because mm. you are, you're on easy street at the moment. So let's take <laughs> advantage of that. Um, and then making a plan. And it, or if you've come with some cash or... Um, or if you want to start investing, then we can do that for you. And that might be, you know, we want to buy a house in a three in a few years' time. So really, we're just looking at high interest savings accounts to get you there. Mm. Um, or for some other clients, it might be an investment property. Or for others, it might be listed property trusts or ETFs or managed funds. Um, but we try to have that same that same mindset question to start then the design your life you want and then the investment conversation. Mm. Um, more and more uh, of our young people, it's it's ETFs, yep. if it's going to be um, an investment because they're cheap, they're easy to understand. Um, mm. Yeah, and I think um, certainly Scott Papers helped with that mm. because he's educated people as to why mm, um, absolutely. you want to consider other types of investments. Mm. Uh, I um, recently spoke with BetaShares, uh, Ilan mm. from BetaShares, and he was saying that four out of ten millennials in the US own ETFs, which I think is a ah, that's interesting statistic. But it's even setting up with things like uh, raise just to get into that habit of playing with the share market mm. um, with a little portion of your, uh, your funds or talking to young people about super and ethical investments. Mm. Um, and certainly if we're talking about super, we always talk ethical. I think young people, that's the thing that I think differs mm. young people from a boomer is they want to know where their funds are being invested. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think we have one thing in common, mm. or the, at least we did. Um, do you own zero shares? shares I do. Of accounting software? Now, yeah. we're not giving you know specific financial <laughs> advice as you go and act on this, but um, one of my things is just, you know, it's all about being comfortable in what you invest mm. in and, and that circle of competence. You as yep. an accountant? Yep. Is that how it comes to be? Oh, absolutely. And uh, often, you know, if I'm talking to someone about shares and they're wanting to dip their toe in, often I say to them, you know, please consider an ETF or something instead. But if you want to play with a small amount of funds, look at what you know. Mm. Um, And certainly if you've got kids, look at what they're playing with because often they're the early adopters. Mm. But as an accountant, I mean, zero was something that we saw coming. We saw the up. Uh, with the uptake we were going to the zero conferences each year so we knew the numbers we knew the number we yes we were an early adopter with zero but we knew that it was getting to that critical mass point around where people that even weren't great with technology were climbing on board mm. and the number of businesses jumping on board were just escalating so when the ipo happened it just was a no-brainer mm. um, to play with it and of course now 
that we know the share and we know the history. It's really interesting to track the pattern. You can almost always tell when there's a zero con Mm -hmm. or something because you watch the hype in the share and then you watch it settle down. So if you want to play or trade with the shares, it's kind of easy to pick where you'd play (laughs) with it. Um, But, yeah, that's – and certainly it was something – and it's interesting um, because I went around to my accountants and I said, so if you you guys were thinking about – Um, investing you will know this you've all seen it Um, you know you you might only risk 500 bucks but why don't you if you've been thinking about the share market why don't you and I think one of the seven did Mm. because people are still fearful and I have one that says to me I'm still watching it I'm still watching it (laughs) oh that's nice what's that doing for you yeah Yeah. Yeah, it's 500 bucks give it a shot exactly (laughs) it's like come on (laughs) yeah no that's that's I think that's a great um point to step off for, Mm. for for beginners um for example I have a landscaper friend who mm-hmm. came to me and said, I'm looking at investing. And then I said, tell me what you know. What do you know? Yes. And he came up with a company called Bingo Industries, which does the garbage bins. Ah. So it's something that like, he sees them on the job site. He knows yep. people that work for them. So it's, it's it's kind of a great way to yeah. not only to, to put your money to work, but also understand how, I suppose, capitalism works and how to yes. you know, make the economy work for you rather than you work for the economy. And it's somewhere to start. So he might say that and think, that looks interesting. And then go to the financials or go to mm. the four or five indicators you use to see if you think that's a good company. Mm. But at least it's a start. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. Um, okay, as we're coming towards the end of the conversation, um, mm. I just want to circle off this investing component. I read in the book that you've you've distinguished between good debt, mm. okay debt and bad debt. Yeah. Perhaps you can tie in with investing how you see the use of money and debt particularly. Yeah, so I find Australians a really interesting relationship with debt and I saw an, an, a client um, earlier today where her whole focus was getting rid of a debt mm. and I'm saying to her, but this is okay debt. We're, we're comfortable with this debt. No, 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 I just need it gone. Mm. Um, so we have this weird psychology with debt, whereas I think we need to bucket it to good, bad or okay. Um, so good debt is if debt that I'm using for an asset that's going up in value. So for um, an investment property in Australia, you can get a tax deduction for it. It's mm. going up in value. That's good debt. Same for shares. Um, okay debt is a mortgage because it's going up in value, but especially in a low interest environment, but we wouldn't mind getting it mm. down. Help debt in a, lo- in a low CPI environment, it's going up by 1% or 2%. For me, that's okay debt. Bad debt is car loans and personal loans and afterpay and credit cards and all those other debts that are high interest. They're for experiences or goods that are going to go down in value. So we want to wipe that clean first. And for me, the order of getting rid of debt is bad and then okay and then good. Yeah. Yeah. And that just makes so much sense to me. Mm. Um, it's a common theme I've had throughout the guests on the series. Yeah. Um, I've had experiences with debt, many of them, and uh, can distinguish between what's yeah. good and, um, and what's not. Um, but the okay. average Australian, I think, will be pushing down their mortgage at the same time as they're pushing down their investment loan. And it's mm. just realising as long as the bucket's going down, mm. you can actually choose what you what you put most off. Mm. Yeah, great. Um Okay, so let's close off with some some thoughts. Um, mm. As you're the first Australian financial author on the show, uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you two questions on books in particular. Mm. First is, how many books did you read before you published? Uh, see, I'm a book nerd, so um, so I'm a speed reader. I right. um, had a really int- I had an interesting childhood. I think that's what people don't have great childhoods call them (laughs) um so I escaped into books so I read voraciously so I I can't tell you the amount I would have read right okay so (laughs) hundreds was it oh thousands thousands yeah absolutely yeah yeah okay well then this is next this next question part two of this is going to be good Mm. what are your must read finance books huh so I'm going to give you a strange answer so Mm -hmm. I really like part of Tony Robbins book where he talks about ETFs and and the mindset chunk of his book is it unshakables uh unshakables. money the money game yep yep um I really like um if you've if you're a business owner Jim Collins mm-hmm. good to great which 
it's still a finance book because he still co- talks about finance principles um, and Robert Kiyosaki um, as well. Um, I really love E-Myth by Michael oh, yeah. Gerber, yep. of course, again, for I think for business, for business owners, owners, if they're not yep. thinking that way. I like Scott Pape's Barefoot Investor because mm-hmm. I like that uh, for, well, we failed the financial literacy test from the Hilda Report this year mm. and he does, like he's just giving financial literacy um, in, uh, in step-by-step mm. uh, morsels. So I think seeing the difference that has made in people's lives, I can't help but put that on the list. Um, but probably my favourite finance books is Good to Great okay. by Brene Brown. Okay. So she's a shame researcher and it's not a finance book. <laughs> um, but she talks about vulnerability and shame. And I think there is so much linked between that and money that I think if you read that book and if you can actually start to understand how you think and behave, you can translate that mm. to your finances. So, Okay, so what's the yeah. title? Uh, so it's Brene Brown. Uh, daring greatly. She's okay, coming I, out next year. I'm very excited. Oh, are you going to try and meet her? Or? <laughs> oh yeah, I've got tickets. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I think I think that's a great list. Uh, mm. It's interesting that you say Scott Pape, Barefoot Investor. Yeah. It's in my experience, some financial advisors have pushed back against a lot of the stuff that he says, but yeah, I bet they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> um, but I think I think it's a wonderful book. Yeah, for me, because I was asked, I was on a panel um, with an academic. She really looked down and nose at it mm. um, because it's not highbrow. I'm like, yeah. really? If someone's actually, like, what's more, what's better? That something's written with beautiful prose and mm. done very eloquently and it sits on a bedside table and is never read or something's written in a way that's blokey and ochre and people actually read it mm. and do something about it. I know which one I'd prefer. Yeah, so. yeah me too. Okay. Um, where can our listeners learn more about you? Um, so I guess if you go to Melissa Brown, and there's an E on the end of brown.com.au, that directs you to my businesses and my books yep. um, or the Money Bar um, or Buy ATA. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Or if you're on Instagram, I'm a bit of a nerd on there. So more money for shoes. <laughs> more money for shoes. Okay. That's the name of the book. What about the other two? Um, Unfudge, which is the... Not so pretty. Uh, name of the book: uh, Unfudgy Finances and Fabulous But Broke. Okay. Last question. My, sure. My favorite. If you could go back and you could tell a younger you just one thing, uh, one thing uh, yeah. about finance, money, or investing. I tell her to start early. Mm-hmm. I tell her just to ignore credit because I am not. I do not handle credit well, so I just would tell her to mm-hmm. don't get a credit card, and yeah, I tell her to take risks. Yeah, because all of the things I, I regret more that I didn't do than things that I did do. Mm. So I tell her to take more risks. Wonderful advice. Mm. Thank you for your time on the show. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for tuning in to the Australian Investors Podcast. For further episodes, head to www.raskfinance.com. To provide feedback, nominate a guest or hear from me, you can find me on Twitter with the handle at Owen Rask. Cheers to our financial futures.